What was characteristic with Schaeffer was his accumulation of paraphilia. And what does paraphilia mean? Well, they're what we used to call sexual perversions, they're unusual erotic motivations that are not at all shared by everyone. In Schaeffer's case, it was his excessive and very erotic taste for pleasure he took in his sadism against his victims. He was sadistic towards them by practicing bondage, the bands and straps that were found in his drawings and his actual crimes and at the scene of his crimes. But also he eroticized everything to do with fecal matter, and that's coprophilia, everything to do with urine and urinary emissions, that's urophilia. He made his victims drink to to watch them urinate and he would photograph them, which is highly characteristic. He would of course get sexual pleasure from this and especially there's this sadism, which is also an extreme and very dangerous form of paraphilia. And while Schaeffer was accruing all this, he had a protective social facade which made him a very dangerous individual. During his trial, Schaeffer avoids the death penalty, which is suspended at the time in Florida. He is condemned to life in prison. Later, when he is still behind bars, he is officially connected to 32 other murders committed in the area, based on proof found in his home. This is the house where Gerard John Schaefer lived when I met him in 1964. Sandra London knew Gerard Schaefer well. She dates him for a year, then loses contact with him and gets back in touch with him ten years later when she finds out about his crimes. He always had two stories. Basically, the one was, I am the greatest killer of women in this century. The other side was, I'm innocent, I never killed anyone and I'm a framed cop. And he, it was a wonderful, wonderfully memorable moment. He leaned forward and spoke very slowly as he looked into my eyes. And he said, you don't understand because you're not a serial killer. When he was convicted of the two murders, uh, Robert Stone connected him to 34 dead or missing girls that they weren't able to bring a case on. In dialoguing with Schaefer about that figure, uh, he suggested, or he didn't suggest, he stated in a letter in writing that, uh, that his own number would be closer to somewhere between 80 and 110. And he said, he went on about this at length. I mean, it's disgusting, but he was saying, how do you count a murder if you have a, a victim gagged and they choke on their vomit is that a murder if you kill a woman who's pregnant is that two murders or one so he he raised that penumbra uh issue on the actual count of actual murders locked up in his cell gerard schaefer takes his sins to an extreme and publishes short stories entitled Killer Fiction, in which he portrays his own crimes, using a novel as his alibi. The police also use these stories to connect him to other unsolved murders. In the 1960s, Schaefer lives with his parents in the seaside town of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He is from a very devout Catholic family. As a child, Schaefer begins to hate his father, who starts to cheat on his wife, while he maintains an intimate relationship with his mother. He was allowed access to his mother's bedroom to sleep right in the bed with his mother up until age 16. Sandra London also remembers an episode that at the time didn't particularly traumatize her. She was 16 years old. We find ourselves sitting out on the beach at night, huddled in, a, in, the, in the blanket we usually use to lie down on, 
Instead, we had it around our shoulders this time. And he totally broke down. And he told me that he had uh, overwhelming desires to kill women. In hindsight, Sandra London remembers years later episodes that punctuate their youth and that will enable her to make Schaefer talk. When Stéphane Bourgoin meets him in November 1991, Gerard Schaefer has been in prison for 18 years. He never officially confessed to his crimes, sometimes revealing an anecdote about the disappearance of some young women, he was content to play cat and mouse games with the law, who tried to make him admit his guilt. Stefan tries a roundabout way to get him to talk. 